Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Cynthia Gotro, and I am a professor at the College of Education in Cal State Fullerton. And today we have a special guest, Christine Quinn. She will be providing us with an informative and highly interactive webinar on the topic of transitioning to teaching in higher education. So please know that this is recorded and will be posted on YouTube. If you have any questions, please use the chat window. And at this time, I would like to ask that you mute your microphone. And in order to do that, just move your mouse to the lower left-hand corner of the screen and click on the mute button. So thank you, Christine. Please Thanks, Cynthia. Okay. Well, thank you for joining me tonight. I'm happy to be here with you talking about the topic of transitioning to teaching in higher education, uh, since it actually is a move that I was able to make several years ago. So uh, just to introduce myself, um, now, here we go. Um, so I am actually a product of Cal State Fullerton. And I started there by uh, receiving my multiple subject credential um, a few years ago. Um, I'm telling you my story because I think that it has merit in um, making connections and finding a good fit for the place where you are wishing to uh, continue work in higher education. So after I received my credential, um, at that point in time, I really kind of already knew that my future goal was to work with um, a credential um, people getting their credentials, uh, pre-service teachers. So I already kind of started spreading the word to my faculty people that in the future, they should be looking for me because I'd like to be there someday. I went to the field and started teaching for a few years um, in the elementary school and I served as a master teacher for Cal State Fullerton as well. Uh, after I was in the field for a few years, I went back and got my master's degree in curriculum and instruction again from Cal State Fullerton. And at that same time, I was working on my national board certification. Um, and I wasn't quite busy enough being a full-time teacher working on my master's and doing my national board certification. So I decided to jump in and was offered one class as an adjunct faculty at Cal State Fullerton. Uh, so I jumped at that opportunity when it was offered to me. Um, when I became a full-time faculty member at Cal State Fullerton was in 2001. So I had finished my master's degree. So today I am a full-time lecturer. I am not a tenure track faculty member, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, and you can ask me questions about it. I work in the elementary and bilingual education department, and I am a block leader. I am a program coordinator for supervisors and um, uh, for supervisors that are working with our teacher candidates in the field. So, before we get started really into the content, here's our agenda for the night. We're gonna be talking about um, what's moving you to make that decision. Are you ready for this change? What are you gonna to have to do to go through the application process? We'll talk a little bit about networking. That's a really important. Um, I think that both Cynthia and I can attest to the fact that networking was important in us uh, landing a job in higher education. We'll talk about some of the different levels and roles that are available to you. Um, and then really we'll just talk about how is it the same and, and how is it different than working with our K-12 people um, making that switch to college. And uh, Cynthia said that this is going to be highly interactive, but it's only going to be highly interactive if you interact with me. So here's your first opportunity. I sort of always want to check where where you are um, whenever I'm teaching I always check access that background information and it helps me to kind of uh, decide where to go with conversation so tell me uh, why are you here today and what sort of things are you thinking about in the future I know you are interested in possibly someday making that transition 
And if you want to tell me something a little more specific, I'm going to give you a minute or two here to um, type in your chat box any sort of information that you want to share. So let's chat. Why are you here today? What information can I hopefully share with you? What is moving you to make this uh, decision for a change? And I've got my chat box open. Okay. And so far, I don't see people weighing in. Oh, I've got a minute. Oh, here you come. Here you come. I see you now. Okay. Um, uh, Cynthia, can they all see the chat box or can just I see the chat box? They can all see it. Uh, how about if I read them to you? Awesome. All right. Um, I've been interested in teaching at the college level, so when I saw this wonderful webinar pop up, I was excited. That's one. <clears throat> Another one is, I am definitely interested in maybe transitioning into higher ed. I've worked with supplemental instruction through CSUF, and I've been exposed to the rigor of the subject, which is biology. I love the rigor of college, but I love high school kids. Mm -hmm. And then Juliana says, I would like to know how necessary it is to have taught in an elementary school, high school level before teaching at the college level. Maybe you want to answer that one. Yeah, I, I would love to answer that one. And in fact, it's, it is on a, a future slide, but we can jump into it right now and then we'll talk a little bit in more detail about that. Um, so if you are going to make uh, teach at the college level, it is certainly a very good idea to have experience in teaching somewhere in the K-12 um, arena, especially if you're thinking about getting into uh, working with pre-service teachers. Now, if you're looking into transitioning into um, an area that is not credentialing, then the K-12 experience won't be as important. But if you're looking to work with teacher candidates, your experience in the K-12 setting is going to be paramount and it is going to be what they want to hear and what they learn most from is your experiences um, so here's a, here's another comment which is um, I wonder or I'm sorry I'm wondering what a master's of science in instructional design qualifies me to teach in higher ed I could answer that great you can teach instructional design courses <laughs> Kai and um, there are uh, more and more offered at different universities as well as Cal State Fullerton. In fact, a few of our faculty um, have a master's degree in instructional design. And you have one more comment, which is looking for a way to give back to the system and follow the Cal State University mission. Awesome. We love to hear that. And that certainly kind of was uh, um, my path as well that um that idea that that there's a there's kind of a, a cyclical pattern where you become the expert teacher and then you really do want to kind of uh share that with your future teachers that are coming up um so that's certainly a, a great reason to make that change um and you know the change is sometimes a, a scary thing and um, any change is sometimes scary but we'll talk about that a little bit as well so I'm going to go ahead and keep going so it looks like a lot of us are just thinking about that we have had k-12 experience and that you're thinking about transitioning um, so let's keep going if you have questions as we're going along please feel free to, to uh, put them in you do not have to wait for a place in the presentation where I say, hey, you can ask a question. Feel free to do that um, as we're going along. Okay, so one of the things that you already told me, somebody told me that this opportunity to impact more elementary students through producing strong teachers and that idea of working with the next generation of teachers 
is really a strong pull for you. Um, perhaps maybe you also like the idea of pursuing uh, research or conducting your own research. Um, you know, in the elementary and in the K, in the middle and high school levels, we can certainly do our action research within our classrooms. Um, the opportunity at the university is greater for research because you have more access um, to students um, and certainly people to collaborate with and, and research teams. And um, adding to that current field of knowledge is an exciting endeavor and, and it's, it's fun to collaborate with people. Um, and that's something that usually when we are in the K-12 uh, field, you just don't have the time to be able to dedicate to that scholarship. So if that is something that is exciting to you, um, then you definitely wanna think about pursuing that next level. So how do you apply? There is not one way, there's not one answer, and every um, institution that you go to has their own uh, systems. So you really want to be knowledgeable about the institution that you are applying to. Um, definitely when you're searching for a job, you want to find the university or the institution that fits your desires and your needs. Um, just like when we were looking for our K-12 jobs, you want to interview the school as well as them interviewing you. So does it fit what your desires for your teaching are? Um, and then what you want to do is you want to look at the human resources department. Um, they all have a website and they all have a certain protocol and a way that, that they prefer applications to come in. Certainly one of the first things that, that we tell everybody is make sure that you ask questions along the way. Uh, that does not look bad upon you um, in a job interview. It tells them that you are interested in having the right information. Something again to remember is to look at the mission statement and the key planning initiatives and priorities at the institution, the universities that you're looking at. Um, if you can speak to those areas of interest, then you're going to make a stronger candidate. Um, how does the hiring department present itself online? So again, make sure that you see yourself as a great fit um, in those areas that concern you. There is definitely a protocol and different institutions will have different uh, ways that they want you to apply. Make sure that you know how the hiring protocol um, is going for the college that you're at. Do they want you to apply online? If they want you to apply online, definitely do that. Um, sometimes you'll hear, well, it's good to go in person and make those connections. Well, that's true. It is good to go in person and we will talk about networking, but if it is during the time that you are handing in the application and it says presented online and you go in person, they won't like that. So make sure that you follow the hiring protocol that is set forth. Um, one of the, the things that we hear about a lot is that the interview process it takes a long time. You might have to have several interviews. You might have to wait a long time before you even get any uh, word that they want to interview you. So be patient, um, check in, and make sure that you are following the hiring protocol that is required. One of the uh, things to keep in mind when you are looking to make the transition to higher education is that a lot of people are trying to make that transition to higher education. And then you also have people who um, are looking into the higher education as their, as their first job, people who have not had the teaching experience. So there really is a lot of competition and you really need to be the person that says, I am the best person for the job. Just like you uh, would tell any of your own students, 
to really sell yourself. So when you create that resume, make sure that you know exactly what they're looking for and use some of those keywords that are listed in the job description and give proven um, uh, examples of how you uh, meet those descriptions and instances that you can share with them um, where you have you have demonstrated competence and mastery in those areas. Um, as in any job interview, uh, the cover letter is going to be important. And really in that cover letter is where you really want to highlight how you are the first person for that job. How do you fit the job um, better than any other candidate that, that they are looking at? Make sure that you highlight your areas of expertise. And remember, sometimes we have expertise um, that we don't always feel are as important as others. And I would say, if you have an area of expertise, make sure that you highlight that. Um, even if you feel like it's disconnected, uh, do you help to run the, um, the, the drama productions at your school site? Are there after school programs that you are uh, running or in charge of? Are there committees or programs that you have piloted or initiated? Um, have you worked at the district level? Uh, perhaps maybe with a new uh, textbook adoption or um, something in the area of curriculum um, and instruction. Make sure that you highlight those. Um, so I have here, it's not enough that you think you have the smarts to handle the duties. You really have to provide the, um, the evidence that shows this. Um, so, one of our participants is saying, is the process similar for a part-time faculty as well as a full-time faculty? Um, there are some differences. There are some differences. So we will keep thinking about this as we continue to talk. I am going to address that as well. So are there any questions so far? You hear from everybody in all fields that networking is a necessary um, endeavor. And I can certainly attest to that because I think without networking, I would not be in the position that I am in. Um, I have kind of a unique story in that uh, I was known to the uh, elementary and bilingual education department at Cal State Fullerton because I was a student there. I was a graduate of the program. Um, I was also a graduate of the master's program as well. And again, remember I told you that for years I told my instructors that I had the goal in mind of teaching one day at the university. So I was actually turning in my project, somebody who just has their project in hand um, right before the, the, uh, this presentation started. So congratulations, take that um, project and walk the halls at Cal State Fullerton. You never know what will happen. Um, I didn't even really know that they were looking for hires and this was at a time um, that was unique because they were looking for lecturers, not tenure track people. Um, I was in the right place at the right time and I knew the right people. And when I talked to people around me in my department, uh, Cynthia being one, she will also agree that it was about the networking, the connections that she had, um, people who knew her, that gave her the upper hand and the edge over other people that they might have considered for the job. So if you're thinking about um, networking, think about people that you have had 
perhaps in your master's program as a faculty member um, or anybody else that you know, particularly in higher education that might be able to give you a good recommendation, somebody who knows you well. Um, and then don't forget also about the, the, the possibility of social media. Um, I know so many people in the profession that are on LinkedIn. Um, there are also other platforms out there, but don't underestimate the idea of social networks as well. So I'm gonna give you an opportunity here and say, how are you networking? And it really is a little bit of a ride. So are you ready for that ride? So why don't you tell me a little bit right now, again, interacting, um, what are some ideas that you have for networking? What have you been doing? And, and any secrets that you wanna share with other participants in this webinar? I'm gonna give you a few minutes here. And Cynthia's gonna be watching our chat box. Okay, I see a few people that are adding in, um, uh, mostly LinkedIn, uh, trying to connect with old professors. Um, and a couple who haven't started networking much. Oh, this is great. I joined the Reading Guild run by the Reading Department and attend their functions. That's a good idea, Monica. Um, Yep, connecting with your old professors. Good, Juliana, keep doing that. All right, it's a difficult doing online classes. It's true. It's, it's difficult to, to network um, when you're just doing online classes. Um, although if that is the platform that you're hoping to teach in, then that certainly is a good place. Uh, remember that, that the online platform, just like tonight, um, is interactive. And so don't discount that as uh, reaching out to those professors and, and networking with them as well. Um, let's see. Oh, somebody just connected with somebody in, in uh, Arkansas. Um, making those connections, good. And then Cindy says, don't forget the CSUF Alumni Association hosts events that might be worth attending. So again, getting your face out there, getting your name out there, those are all good ideas. If you have not started networking yet, it's not too late. Don't, don't uh, fear, you have time. Um, and the first step really is starting where you're at. So if you are a current student, perhaps you are in your master's program, start talking to those professors right now and letting them know that you are interested in making that switch to the higher education field um, and kind of pick their brain and see what kind of suggestions they have for you. You never know who knows who. Um, and as teachers, I think that if you've been in the field long enough, you know how small the world of education is, and there are a lot of connections out there. Um, oh, somebody says, get a blog going and do some regular tweets every week. Another great idea. So uh, she hopes to start, or hopes to start once again after the thesis project is done, and isn't that the case because certainly we are busy busy people as educators and networking feels like oh my gosh one more thing to fill my time with but it certainly is um, important so let's keep moving forward Cynthia reminds us to answer the survey when we were are uh, done with this webinar so credentialing 
what credentialing do you need? If you're working in higher education as a uh, faculty member in a teaching position, uh, you need a minimum of a master's degree. And if you would like to be tenure track, um, that is not enough. So you may not make the move between a non-tenure track and tenure track without uh, reapplying for a position. So for example, I am hired with a master's degree. I am a non-tenure track person. I have been teaching at Cal State Fullerton now for 16 years, and I cannot just switch to tenure track because I have a good record at Cal State Fullerton. I would actually have to uh, get my doctorate and then reapply as a tenure track if and only if the position was open. So again, I would have to do the same things. I would have to network, I would have to prove myself in that position with that job description that I was the best fit for that um, position. And when you are applying for tenure track positions, you have to know again that the competition is um, it's fierce, it's, it's extreme. There's a lot of qualified people. When universities are looking for tenure track people, they're doing a national search. And so they are looking for people um, not just within their university. Uh, a lot of the things that I hear and a lot of the things that I have seen um, on discussion boards, People talk about how the universities always hire within, and if you're not an insider, you can't get the job. And that simply isn't true. Um, the searches are national searches, usually, um, so they're looking for the best candidate. If you are um, a PhD or an EDD and you're looking for that tenure track, some of the things that they're looking for is your research and publications in peer-reviewed journals? Do you um, have a strong background in that writing? Are you doing presentations at national conferences or even state conferences? I know many of you who are in the classroom right now are also presenting at conferences. Um, so that's an important thing that they look for. And then again, in most cases, if you want to work with pre-service teachers, that experience in the K-12 teaching is going to be very important. Now, it doesn't need to be a lifetime of experience in K-12 teaching. Um, I had six years in K-12 teaching experience when I moved to the university. So um, it doesn't have to be a long time. If you are looking for job openings, perhaps maybe you're looking at Cal State Fullerton or one of the other uh, four-year universities, and um, that might work, but also you might wanna expand your, your search also to some of the community colleges and also the online colleges. Um, you can always make a transition to a four-year university when you have some experience in working on these uh, different levels as well. And there are actually uh, advantages and disadvantages to all three of these uh, different institutions. Again, it depends on what you're looking for. Um, some people love online teaching and online learning and really have no interest in, in that face-to-face -face, uh, format or platform. So an online college would be a really good place for you to look. The community colleges um, are also a great place to look as well. Okay, so there's different positions that are available um, when we're looking at obtaining a position at the higher uh, education. Um, there's certainly full-time teaching. And there are different levels. You can work with undergraduates in um, prerequisite courses. You could also work, if you are looking to work with pre-service teachers, we consider that post-baccalaureate um, level, and then also in the graduate level as well. If you're going to be teaching the graduate level, it is more likely that they will require a, a doctorate um, than if you're working in the post-bac or the undergraduate. Um, 
you've, I'm sure, heard the term adjunct uh, faculty, which is a part-time job. These are sometimes great positions for you to look at and to um, kind of test your um, interest. You can kind of, you know, stick that toe in the water, see if you like it. That's what I did. I taught one class at the university while I was still teaching in the elementary school. I would go at night and, and teach the introductory to elementary education at Cal State Fullerton to see if I really liked it. And it turns out that I loved it. So think about maybe starting with that part-time teaching. And then if you're thinking about making that transition and, and uh, you're not exactly sure if you want to be working full-time or part-time, you really want to work with pre-service teachers, maybe you're having a hard time getting a position at a university, then remember that we employ a lot of people as adjunct uh, faculty that supervise our teacher candidates in the field. So if you've ever been a mentor teacher, you know that your teacher candidate has a university faculty member that comes in and visits them and works with them in the field while they're student teaching. Um, we hire a lot of, of people that way. And as our uh, numbers increase, as the job market increases, um, our need for part-time and supervisors are increasing as well. And then again, there is the possibility for online teaching as well. Not only at online universities, but at um, four-year institutions as well. You know that, that uh, Cal State Fullerton offers a lot of online classes, and that is something that you can look at. I'm looking a little bit here at the questions and seeing if there's anything that I need to address. Um, it looks like Cynthia is also helping me to address some of those questions as well. There is one comment here, Christine, that um, you might want to address. I have okay. no prior work experience. Will I be a good candidate if I apply? Should I do an internship first? Um, so an internship is, a, is uh, Cynthia, read that question to me one more time. I'm, Looking. Sure. It says, I have no prior work experience. Will I be a good candidate if I apply? Should I do an internship first? Oh, I see it here. Um, I think that it means, I, I think that it depends on what this uh, person means about no prior work experience. Do they mean no teaching experience? Um, and it would depend upon what job you are applying for. Again, remember that they are looking for the best candidate. So if you are thinking about teaching pre-service teachers, or if you're thinking about teaching in the field of education, then certainly that teaching experience is going to be important. Um, the word internship is an interesting thing to me right now because it used to be um, more common that we'd have interns in the field of education. Uh, there's less and less opportunities for those internships. So um, I'm not going to tell you to, to do an internship because I'm not too sure if you could even uh, get an internship. Um, certainly, I think that prior work experience is going to be key. So what are some things that you can do to build that prior work experience? Certainly, it would be working um, as a teacher in some capacity. Um, maybe it doesn't mean that you're in the school system, but that you have a leadership role in some other capacity where you are uh, acting as an educator. And I'm looking here at Julian as it says, what does related fields mean for education? If I have a degree in education with an emphasis in reading and literacy, would I be able to teach remedial basic English courses at the community college, or does that require an English degree specifically? Um, no, I think that you absolutely could teach those classes at the community college, and I think that you would actually be a better candidate than somebody with simply an English degree because you have 
not only the reading expertise, um, but you also have the teaching expertise as well. So you would be actually a stronger candidate for that position um, in teaching remedial and basic English courses at the community college level. Um, and then Cynthia says, is a master's required for an adjunct position? Yes, it is. Um, even if you're going to be working just, uh, like I said, as the university supervisor, that master's is required. Okay, keep the questions coming and we'll, we'll continue. Hopefully either Cynthia or I will be answering them as we go along. Um, when people want to make the switch to um, education in, higher, in the higher education institutions, they always want to know um, how it's similar and how it's different. So we'll talk about that next. What are the most interesting questions that I get from people is why did you leave the classroom and I always have to giggle a little bit and I say pretty sure I'm still in the classroom I just have taller students so certainly much of what I am doing at the college level is similar to what I was doing in the k6 k6 level as well um, but there are some differences, and I'll highlight a few, and then you can ask me questions and we can chat about a few others as well. But, um, you know, one of the big differences uh, is that when you're working at the college, usually those students are attending by choice, um, and they're paying for it. But that doesn't necessarily mean that their star students who turn in all their work and want to please the instructor, believe it or not, even though they're attending by choice, um, there still are students who uh, struggle to uh, do the requirements. There are still students who choose not to come to class. Um, certainly not if you're in the credential program because that is not an option. Uh, but, you know, I don't want to. Um, I don't want you to think that that when you move to the college level all of those issues that we have in teaching go away because the students are there by choice um, one of the other things that might excite you is that you're not working with parents and uh, when I say that initially some teachers say yay because that that certainly takes a lot of time and it certainly is sometimes um, a difficult position but I also say that it also means that you don't necessarily have a team of people that you are working with to motivate a student so it can be a double-edged sword um, and then you know there's the uh, developmental readiness of course where college students are usually and I should have highlighted usually uh, more mature in their approach to their education but again not always. Um, just because they're university students doesn't make them necessarily um, the, uh, the star student. Somebody asked about letters of recommendation. Um, uh, I, I did not address letters of recommendation, um, but certainly it is always a good idea to get letters of recommendation. If you are um, in the teaching field right now, then certainly a letter of recommendation from a principal or a district personnel might be a good idea. The question is, do they know that you're thinking about the change? Do you want them to know that you're thinking about it? Um, you, you want a letter of recommendation from somebody who's in a leadership position who can speak to your strengths and who um, will uh, help you along that process as well. Um, again, I would look at my human resources and I would look for the job requirements for whether they are requesting uh, letters of recommendation. But if you are, um, 
if you are in the teaching field or, or, or any profession, I know that as I go along in my profession, I continue to collect letters of recommendation from people, even if they're not formal letters, um, because those things come in handy. Um, even if it's just for an evaluation, a self-evaluation. So it's never a bad idea. Some of the things about working with college students are very similar to working with students in the K-12 setting. Um, and and this, is, this is what I tell people, my students are just taller at the university. Um, and it, we all can relate to this because at some point in time we are all learners and all you have to do is go into a teacher's uh, staff meeting to see how we act as learners, uh, both as adults and children. So sometimes I find myself using the same strategies with my university students as I did uh, when I was working in the K-6 setting as well. Um, but the, the bottom line is that effective teaching is necessary. It doesn't matter how old your students are. Um, effective teaching, effective management, active teaching, making those connections so that your students are drawn to you by building relationships. All of those things are uh, similar to working with your K-12 students. Um, and again, classroom management and discipline, you know, sometimes we struggle at the university as well with the same types of things with, uh, you know, students being off task, students being distracted by their phones, uh, students working on assignments for other um, classes while they're in your class. So those kinds of things are sometimes similar. Um, but you know, you handle it just the same way that you would um, if you were working with uh, either a primary student or a high school student. Um, those same strategies I still put in place. It, that kind of takes me to the position of, of what do university students want from you as an instructor? And here is a really important topic. Um, if you are thinking about making the transition and you are a teacher that really enjoys the relationship part with your students then the universities are a really great place for you to be um, the college students are usually very eager uh, they're eager to learn they are at, most of them are at a transition point in their lives um, where they are making big changes and they are looking for people who have uh, expertise, who have been through situations that will share with them. Um, if any of you ever had that college instructor where you went and visited that instructor during office hours and or sat and chatted and had coffee in the student union, you know that those relationships are really important. In, um, in effective learning. Now, we know that from, from years of experience that are of research, I'm sorry, years of research that says the most important factor in a child or an adult's success is the teacher. So being that um, teacher whose class is exciting and engaging, connected to students' lives. Students are up and out of their chairs and creating and problem solving, collaborating. Those students want to come to your class. Um, you have an opportunity to make a really big impact on them. And, and, and that part is different than you're working with children. Um, now, one of the, the interesting things is that you don't always get the same type of feedback at the university. Uh, when I left the elementary school, I was used to students giving me positive feedback, positive interactions. Uh, certainly the, um, the notes, the hugs, the, the, the conversations from parents about how happy their student is in your classroom, 
those things don't happen as much at the university. Um, so that was something that, that I missed a little bit because you don't necessarily always get that interact, that, that feedback, even if that is the case. Um, students are really, really eager to learn from people who have been in the trenches. They want to hear your stories. They, they want to hear that others who have gone before them have, have had difficult experiences that they have grown from and gotten through to the other end. Um, again, if you have any questions about anything, please feel free to jump in. Um, we've got uh, about 10 minutes or so left to go. So um, I think that some of the advantages for myself and uh, from the research says that when people make that switch to higher education, there really is a more flexible schedule. There's a greater variety of work. Um, it's not a feeling of being in the same place every day at the same time with the same bell schedule. Um, I remember when I moved to the university and, and I, I had a, a different start time than what I was used to. It was later in the day. And I was at the grocery store at about 10.30 in the morning. And I thought, this is what the world looks like at 10.30. It was amazing to me to have that flexible schedule because if you are in the, in the K-12 setting, you know that, that you run according to the bell schedule just like your students do. So certainly that uh, flexible schedule and that autonomy is a great, a great advantage. Um, it also gives you an advantage to really uh, work with others in partnerships, community partnerships. Um, you will find colleagues that you share research ideas and agendas with that you'll be able to partner with. Um, that collaboration is really an exciting thing. The, also the idea of just being surrounded by um, people who are highly educated and work in the field of research. For me, that was a change that I really embraced and I enjoyed being around the academic conversations and kind of the, the, um, the rigor of thought that was elevated from what I was experiencing in the K-12 setting. Um, so, you know, it's an interesting thing that one of the advantages, and I, and I don't think that it's a fair advantage, but I do think that it's a true advantage, is that uh, difference of level of respect from society. Um, I, I remember when I made the switch to the university, and, and somehow people, when I said that I was a university instructor, um, they approached me differently than when I said I was an elementary school teacher. Um, again, just like on the slide, it's, it's not a valid reason, but there, there is a different expectation um, for these roles. And that was something that I enjoyed. I, I enjoyed the idea of feeling like I was part of the rigor of higher education. I'm going to look over at my questions here for a second and see if anybody's got some. Hi, um, Hi Christine. Uh, you do have a couple questions. Um, so Cynthia K. I'm so sorry, Cynthia. I cannot pronounce your last name. I'm not even going to try. My apologies. Um, she would like to know a little bit about how do you know how to design a syllabus? Oh, great question. Uh, well, when you are part of a faculty, there are these wonderful things I'm going to speak on, on my experience in my department, in my college. Um, the whole entire College of Education at Cal State Fullerton has designed or has syllabus templates that you are required to follow. Uh, we go through national accreditation and they uh, require us to have the same elements on our syllabus. It doesn't mean that you don't have academic freedom and that you don't get to design your daily lessons um, and assignments the way that you want to, but there are certainly guidelines and templates that you have to follow. Um, so you're not just creating something from scratch. 
Cynthia, do you want to add anything to that or? Um, I think that it is a little challenging initially when you take a look at the syllabi and you see that there's 10 pages. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so you wonder like, how did they put all this in there? But so you do have a template that you can add to, but the actual curriculum that you cover each week, and that would be in the course schedule, that truly is the faculty member's choice. Yeah. So basically when I design a course, even if it's a course that's been taught by another professor, I'll look at the learning objectives and the course assignments that other people use and I'll modify those assignments. And, um, and also modify when those assignments are due. So for example, let's say there's a literature review and maybe one professor assigns it day one and it's due the last week of the semester. To me, as a student, I would hate that. Mm -hmm. I would want little checkpoints along the way. So then I would take a look at the um, course calendar and I would say like, okay, so day one, I'll assign it. Week four, I'll have an outline due. Week eight, I'll have a rough draft due. Week 12, it should be pretty much done. And then by the end of the semester, I want a full finished um, product. So as you teach, you know, you know what works for your students because all student populations are different. So you want to embed checkpoints along the way. So if you think about that one example I gave you and take a look at the whole semester, your whole semester, your main goal is to meet the learning objectives. Mm -hmm. So you probably, if you take a look, Cynthia, at one of your um, syllabi, you'll see learning objectives listed, I hope. <laughs> and, um, and then if you read through the learning objectives and then you take a look at the assignments that are due, you'll see that those assignments will mirror the learning objectives. Another thing that is helpful and useful, just like at um, other, uh, other institutions, is that we collaborate. So we find people who are teaching the same class and we can co-plan. Um, and again, you can look at what other people have done. Rarely do you design a new course. That, that does happen, but they would never have a new person design a new course. Um, so you collaborate with people who might have taught it in the past or who are teaching it with you presently um, and, and brainstorm and come up with ideas and, and things that you have. So it's not quite as daunting as it sounds, but believe me, it, it does take quite a bit of work and no matter how many times you proofread and how many times read it over as you're teaching, you have to make changes to that syllabus just uh, like any other teacher because the students are um, different every day and so sometimes things change. Some things might take longer than you thought and you have to make adjustments to um, timelines or due dates and that's something that uh, again as the university instructor you get to make those decisions. Um, so that's an awesome thing. Okay. So, um, oh, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, Christine. Uh, I just, uh, can I give a plug for the survey? Please. Um, so I see that we have 18 people in the room and I'm so excited that all of you are here. And we have had such poor responses for our survey. And I'm, I, I'm enjoying all the webinars, but what, really what we want to know is what do you want to know? What other survey topics do you want? We have no idea. <laughs> so if you could complete the survey, then that will tell us what you want. And um, we're going to do this again in the fall and next spring. And um, the only way we'll know what to offer is if you tell us. So if you could please fill that in, it'll probably take about two minutes to type, type it in. And um, I so appreciate your time. That's all I had. Thank you. So yes, please, please share that information. Uh, that is a really important thing for us. And especially if you are thinking about coming into higher education, you are going to understand how important that data collection is in our decision making process. Um, certainly that that uh, will ensure that we have good quality uh, programs that you're interested in, not things that um, that are not related to your interest. Um, I uh, 
read an interesting research article that um, surveyed 89 teachers who had made the transition from K-12 teaching to the university. Um, and they came from all over the United States, from 15 different states. And the uh, title of it was called Crossing the Bridge, and you can see it there on the slide, transitioning from a K-12 teacher to a college professor in the Journal of Inquiry and Action and Education. Um, so everybody wants to know what the workload is like. Is it harder? Is it easier? Um, so 85% they found of the people that they surveyed indicated that the workload in higher education was at least equal to or uh, more than what they experienced in K-12. Um, certainly those first few years as you make a transition are also uh, more intense and more labor intensive as you're learning to create syllabi. Just like when you began teaching and you started writing lesson plans, everything was more time intensive. Um, but this is a pretty strong number. 85% say, yeah, it's equal to what I do in the K-12 experience or even more than what they experienced in K-12. Um, some of the reasons that they looked at were um, the other requirements aside from teaching that you're expected to do at the higher education level, such as um, service. So you may be asked to be on committees. You may be asked to plan conferences. You may be asked to be um, part of a pilot study. You might be asked to um, look at some community partnership. All of those expectations fall under the idea and under the area of service, which is part of the expectation of being a faculty member. Um, publishing as well as an expectation if you're going to be a tenure track faculty member. It's a, it's a large expectation and you are required to be publishing. And there's even a number of articles that are required um, and in journals that have to be uh, peer-reviewed journals as well. So sometimes that's very time intensive and sometimes that's a little stressful. If you have been working on your 594 project, you might know what publishing feels like. Um, so that is certainly a, something that, that requires a lot of time. Um, again, the ideas of the work that is required outside of the teaching load. And really, as teachers, we know what that means. It's never just a teaching job. There's always the adjunct uh, duties, even in K-12. There's all of the outside things that take our time as well. So if you're thinking about switching over in, into a part-time position, that answer is going to be different. That, that answer is certainly based on full-time uh, faculty experiences. So if you're thinking, hey, you know what, now is the time where I really want to stay in education. I want to work with the next generation that's coming up, but I actually want to slow down a little bit. Then perhaps maybe the part-time instruction is right up your alley. It might be what you're looking for um, because it's not as intensive. Um, Okay, um, from Kelly, she says, after 12 years of teaching in moderate severe programs, I'm interested in teaching at the college level because I feel like new teachers coming in don't really understand the extent of student needs in this area. I don't see a lot of job openings for this. So do you have suggestions for how to make a university believe they need you? Man, I would have a lot of money if I had the answer to that question. Um, I, I really don't have the answer to that question, Kelly. Um, as with any field, the hiring practice and the hiring numbers and everything is always based upon um, number one, budget, and number two, need. So I would say expand your search. I would say keep looking. I would say don't give up um, and make sure that you are looking in the right areas of special education as well. Um, again, perhaps maybe getting your foot in the door with starting as a field supervisor first, 
uh, making those connections, talking to the people in that special education department who um, might have suggestions about what they're looking for, who they're looking for, and when they're looking for it. But um, I wish I had that that magic wand that we, we could all have an easier time hunting for jobs if, if that was the case. Um, 